Welcome to the rest of the foreshadowing lesson. List all the foreshadowings in the following story and then answer the ending questions. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. The Telltale Heart, written by Edgar Allan Poe, performed by David Alnwick, featuring Jesse Cornett, audio production, sound design, and original score by Luke Hodgkinson. True, nervous, very very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none, passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. But for his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold and so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Mad men know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded. With what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh so, gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head in, within the opening, so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ha! <laughs> would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray of light fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight, but I found the eye always closed and so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously and to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man Thank indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon well, him sir. while he slept. I appreciate your concern. 
Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watcher's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness, for the shutters were close fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in bed crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening just as I have done night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief, oh no, it was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that it had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, it's nothing but the wind in the chimney, it's only a mouse crossing the floor, or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain, all in vain, because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern, so I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a simple dim ray like the thread of a spider shot out from the crevice and fell full upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow of my bones but I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the senses? Now, I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury, as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. 
Meantime, their hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, so I am. And now, at the dead hour of night, amidst the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet, for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder louder. I thought the heart must burst, and now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there for many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out. No stain of any kind, no blood spot whatsoever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught it all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men, who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office. And they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled. For what had I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears, but still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness until, at length, I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice. Yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath. And yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh. 
God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chattered pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no, they heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror, this I thought and this I think, but anything was better than this agony, anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer, I felt that I must scream or die, and now, again, hark, louder, 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 villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks here. Here! It is the beating of his hideous heart! Okay, what did you think? Some of you are probably creeped out, and that's good, because that means Edgar did his job. He loves to creep his audiences out. And don't worry, we will be in a very strong relationship with him all year long, because I like his stories, and I think you will too, so we'll read more. But we need to go ahead and talk about a few things. So right now, I want you to think about the dramatic irony and the foreshadowing. What was the dramatic irony in the story? It's that the dramatic irony... There we go. This will work better. <laughs> the dramatic irony was that the narrator killed the old man. We knew that he was going to from the very beginning. And then we also know when he did it. Oh, what do you think about the part when he dismembered the corpse that said... And he did it in the bathtub. That's why he thought he was so brilliant and so genius that he dismembered the corpse in the bathtub. And he said now all the mess was contained in the tub, so he just had to wash it down the drain. He was bragging a little bit, but he was kind of smart. And then he took all the body parts and he hid them underneath the floorboards. Anyway, that's beside the point. Um, the irony was that we knew that he killed the old man, and we knew that he was going to kill the old man from the very beginning. The rest of the people in the story did not. The only one who knew was, well, the old man once he totally got attacked and killed, and then the narrator himself. But I mean, the cops came and did they know? No, they didn't. So that's the dramatic irony. How did we know that was going to happen? Well, that's where foreshadowing comes in. Yeah. So what and I some of the things, and I don't have them all listed, I just listed a few so you could have found probably definitely more. Um, but some of the ones that I found, that you probably found as well, hopefully, was number one, the heartbeat. The fact that he kept hearing the old man's heartbeat, I mean, it was totally his conscience. And he was going a little crazy and kept questioning, am I mad? <laughs> yeah, I think so. So the heartbeat, the fact that he kept hearing it even after the man was dead. The old man's eye bothered the narrator. I mean, he talked about that eyeball a lot. Um, it makes me wonder what it looked like. I mean, did it, did it just look glassy? I mean, my aunt doesn't real she can't see out of one of her eyes and it's because she fell on like a farm piece or a piece of farm equipment when she was younger and it just went straight through her eyeball and so it looks like it's just a foggy eyeball and you can't really see the iris and the pupil too much it's just kind of grayish um and i wonder if it kind of looks like that i don't know maybe um also you have that the narrator watched the old man as he slept and the narrator kept asking the audience if they thought he was mad, and mad means crazy, not angry, but it meant crazy. And you know, when somebody questions their sanity that much, and they keep reinforcing that they're not crazy, they're probably crazy. It's kind of like normally the one who is the loudest when it comes to the matter of lying. Well, I didn't lie. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Mm, normally, it's the liar. So it's the same thing with this. Um, the person who keeps reassuring that he is not crazy. You may think I'm mad, but I'm really not. I promise I'm not mad. Well, yeah, you probably are. So that in itself was a huge foreshadowing tactic. Hopefully you did well on this one. Place this mini lesson at the end of your mini lesson section.